Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Culture of Critique An Evolutionary Analysis of Jewish Involvement in 20th Century Intellectual and Political Movements by Kevin MacDonald Chapter 3 Jews and the Left I could never understand what Judaism had to do with Marxism and why questioning the latter was tantamount to being disloyal to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ralph de Toldano, 1996, discussing his experiences with Eastern European Jewish intellectuals. Socialism, for many immigrant Jews, was not merely politics or an idea. It was an encompassing culture a style of perceiving and judging through which to structure their lives. Irving Howe, 1982 The association between Jews and the political left has been widely noticed and commented on beginning in the 20th century. Whatever their situation, in almost every country about which we have information, a segment of the Jewish community played a very vital role in movements designed to undermine the existing order. Rothman and Lichter, 1982. On the surface, at least, Jewish involvement in radical political activity may seem surprising. Marxism, at least as envisaged by Marx, is the very antithesis of Judaism. Marxism is an exemplar of a universalist ideology, in which ethnic and nationalist barriers within the society and, indeed, between societies are eventually removed in the interests of social harmony and a sense of communal interest. Moreover, Marx himself, though born to two ethnically Jewish parents, has been viewed by many as an anti-Semite. His critique of Judaism, on the Jewish question, Marx, 1843, Conceptualised Judaism as fundamentally concerned with egotistic money-seeking, it had achieved world domination by making both man and nature into saleable objects. Marx viewed Judaism as an abstract principle of human greed that would end in the communist society of the future. However, Marx argued against the idea that Jews must give up their Jewishness to become German citizens and he envisaged that Judaism, freed from the principle of greed, would continue to exist in the transformed society after the revolution. Whatever Marx's views on this subject, a critical question in the following is whether acceptance of radical universalist ideologies and participation in radical universalist movements are compatible with the Jewish identification. Does the adaption of such an ideology essentially remove one from Jewish community and its traditional commitment to separatism and Jewish nationhood? Or, to rephrase this question in terms of my perspective, could the advocacy of radical universalist ideologies and actions be compatible with continued participation in Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy? Notice that this question is different from the question of whether Jews as a group can be adequately characterised as advocating radical political solutions for Gentile societies. There is no implication that Judaism constitutes a unified movement, or that all segments of the Jewish community have the same beliefs or attitudes towards the Gentile community. Jews may constitute a predominant or necessary element in radical political movements, and Jewish identification may be highly compatible with or even facilitate involvement in radical political movements, without most Jews being involved in these movements, and even if Jews are a numerical minority within the movement. Radicalism and Jewish Identification <laughs> 
The hypothesis that Jewish radicalism is compatible with Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy implies that radical Jews continue to identify as Jews. There is little doubt that the vast majority of Jews who advocated leftist causes beginning in the late 19th century were strongly self-identified as Jews and saw no conflict between Judaism and radicalism. Indeed, the largest Jewish radical movements in both Russia and Poland were the Jewish Bunds, which had an exclusive Jewish membership and a very clear program of pursuing specifically Jewish interests. The proletarianism of the Polish Bund was really part of an attempt to preserve the national identity of Jews. Fraternity with the non-Jewish working class was intended to facilitate their specifically Jewish aims, and a similar statement can be made for the Russian Jewish Bund. Since the Bunds comprised by far the majority of the Jewish radical movement in these areas, the vast majority of Jews participating in radical movements in this period were strongly identified as Jews. Moreover, many Jewish members of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union appear to have been intent on establishing a form of secular Judaism, rather than ending Jewish group continuity. The post-revolutionary Soviet government and the Jewish socialist movements struggled over the issue of the preservation of national identity. Despite an official ideology in which nationalism and ethnic separatism were viewed as reactionary, the Soviet government was forced to come to grips with the reality of very strong ethnic and national identifications within the Soviet Union. As a result, a Jewish section of the Communist Party was created. This section fought hard against the Zionist socialist parties, against democratic Jewish communities, against the Jewish faith and against Hebrew culture. It had, however, succeeded in shaping a secular life pattern based on Yiddish as the recognised national language of the Jewish nationality. In fighting for Jewish national survival in the 1920s and in working in the 1930s to slow down the assimilatory process of the Sovietization of Jewish language and culture. The result of these efforts was the development of a state-sponsored separatist Yiddish subculture, including Yiddish schools and even Yiddish Soviets. This separatist culture was very aggressively sponsored by the Evskitsia. Reluctant Jewish parents were forced, by terror, to send their children to these culturally separatist schools rather than schools where the children would not have to relearn their subjects in the Russian language in order to pass entrance examinations. The themes of the prominent and officially honoured Soviet Jewish writers in the 1930s also bespeak the importance of ethnic identity. Quote, the thrust of their prose, poetry and drama, boiled down to one idea. The limitations on their rights under Tsarism and the flowering of the once oppressed Jews under the sun of the Lenin Stalin Constitution. Close quote. Vaxberg, 1994. Further, beginning in 1942 and extending into the post war period, the government sponsored Jewish Anti Fascist Committee, JAC, served to promote Jewish cultural and political interests including an attempt to establish a Jewish republic in the Crimea, until it was dissolved by the government amid charges of Jewish nationalism, resistance to assimilation, and Zionist sympathies in 1948. The leaders of the JAC strongly identified as Jews. The following comments of JAC leader Itzk Pfeffer on his attitudes during the war indicate a powerful sense of Jewish peoplehood extending backwards in historical time. Quote, I spoke that I love my people, but who doesn't love one's own people? My interests in regard to the Crimea and Birodzan, an area of the Soviet Union designated for Jewish settlement, had been dictated by this. It seemed to me that only Stalin could rectify the historical injustice which had been created by the Roman emperors. It seemed to me that only the Soviet government could rectify this injustice by creating a Jewish nation. In 
Kostarinchenko, 1995. Despite their complete lack of identification with Judaism as a religion and despite their battles against some of the more salient signs of Jewish group separatism, membership of the Soviet Communist Party by these Jewish activists was not compatible with developing mechanisms designed to ensure Jewish group continuity as a secular entity. In the event, apart from the offspring of interethnic marriages, very few Jews lost their Jewish identity during the entire Soviet era, and the post-World War II years saw a powerful strengthening of Jewish culture and Zionism in the Soviet Union. Beginning with the dissolution of the JAC, the Soviet government initiated a campaign of repression against all manifestations of Jewish nationalism and Jewish culture, including closing Jewish theatres and museums and disbanding Jewish writers' unions. The issue of the Jewish identification of Bolsheviks, who were Jews by birth, is complex. Pipes, 1993, asserts that Bolsheviks of Jewish background in the Tsarist period did not identify as Jews, although they were perceived by Gentiles as acting on behalf of Jewish interests and were subjected to anti-Semitism. For example, Leon Trotsky, the second most important Bolshevik behind Lenin, took great pains to avoid the appearance that he had any Jewish identity, or that he had any interests in Jewish issues at all. It is difficult to believe that these radicals were wholly without a Jewish identity, given that they were regarded as Jews by others and were the target of anti-Semites. In general, anti-Semitism increases Jewish identification. However, it is possible that in these cases Jewish identity was largely externally imposed. For example, the conflict in the 1920s between Stalin and the left opposition, led by Trotsky, Grigory Zinoviev, Lev Kamenev and Grigory Solkolinkov, all of whom were ethnic Jews, had strong overtones of a Jewish-Gentile group conflict. Quote, the obvious alienness allegedly uniting an entire block of candidates was a glaring circumstance. Vaxberg, 1994. For all of the participants, the Jewish or Gentile backgrounds of their adversaries was highly salient, and indeed Sidney Hook, 1949, notes that non-Jewish Stalinists used anti-Semitic arguments against the Trotskyists. Vaxberg quotes Molotov, Minister of Foreign Affairs and the second most prominent Soviet leader, as saying that Stalin passed over Kamenev because he wanted a non-Jew to head the government. Moreover, the internationalism of the Jewish bloc compared to the nationalism implicit in the Stalinist position is more congruent with Jewish interests and certainly reflects a common theme of Jewish attitudes in post-Enlightenment societies generally. Throughout this period into the 1930s, for the Kremlin and the Lubyanka, the Russian secret police, it was not religion but blood that determined Jewishness. Indeed, the secret police used ethnic outsiders example, Jews in the traditionally anti-Semitic Ukraine, as agents because they would have less sympathy with the natives, Lindemann, 1997, a policy that makes excellent evolutionary sense. Jewish ethnic background was thus important not only to Gentiles, but was subjectively important to Jews as well. When the secret police wanted to investigate a Jewish agent, they recruited a pure Jewish maiden, to develop an intimate relationship with him, implicitly assuming that the operation would work better if the relationship was intra-ethnic. Similarly, there has been a pronounced tendency for leftist Jews to idolise other Jews such as Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg, rather than leftist Gentiles, as in Poland even though some scholars have serious doubts about the Jewish identifications of these two revolutionaries. Indeed, Hook, 1949, 
finds a perception among leftists that there was an ethnic basis for the attraction of Jewish intellectuals to Trotsky. In the words of one, quote, It is not by accident that three quarters of the Trotskyist leaders are Jews. Close quote. There is, then, considerable evidence that Jewish Bolsheviks generally retained at least a residual Jewish identity. In some cases, this Jewish identity may indeed have been reactive, i.e. resulting from others' perceptions. For example, Rosa Luxemburg may have had a reactive Jewish identity since she was perceived as a Jew, despite the fact that she, quote, was the most critical of her own people, descending at times to merciless abuse of other Jews, close quote, Shepherd, 1993. Nevertheless, Luxembourg's only important sexual relationship was with a Jew, and she continued to maintain ties to her family. Lindemann, 1997, comments that the conflict between Luxembourg's revolutionary left and the social democratic reformists in Germany had overtones of Jewish-German ethnic conflict, given the large percentage and high visibility of Jews among the latter. By World War I, Luxembourg's dwindling friendships within the party had become more exclusively Jewish, whereas her contempt for the mostly non-Jewish leaders of the party became more open and vitriolic. Her references to the leadership were often laced with characteristically Jewish phrases. The leaders of the party were Shabbos Goyim of the bourgeoisie. For many right-wing Germans, Luxembourg became the most detested of all revolutionaries, the personification of the destructive Jewish alien. Given these findings, the possibilities that Luxembourg was in fact a crypto-Jew, or that she was engaged in self-deception regarding her Jewish identity, the latter a common enough occurrence among Jewish radicals, seem to be at least as likely as supposing that she did not identify as a Jew at all. In terms of social identity theory, anti-Semitism would make it difficult to adopt the identity of the surrounding culture. Traditional Jewish separatist practices, combined with economic competition, tend to result in anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism in turn makes Jewish assimilation more difficult, because it becomes more difficult for Jews to accept a non-Jewish identity. Thus, in the interwar period in Poland, Jewish cultural assimilation increased substantially. By 1939, one half of Jewish high school students called Polish their native language. However, the continuation of traditional Jewish culture among a substantial proportion of Jews and its correlative anti-Semitism resulted in a barrier for Jews in adopting a Polish identification. From the standpoint of Gentiles, however, anti-Semitic reactions to individuals like Luxembourg and other outwardly assimilating Jews may be viewed as resulting from an attempt to prevent deception by erring on the side of exaggerating the extent to which people who are ethnically Jews identify as Jews and are consciously attempting to advance specifically Jewish interests. Such perceptions of secular Jews and Jews who converted to Christianity have been a common feature of anti-Semitism in the post-Enlightenment world, and indeed, such Jews often maintained informal social and business networks that resulted in marriages and with other baptised Jews and Jewish families, who had not changed their surface religion. I suggest that it is not possible to conclusively establish the Jewish identification or lack of it of ethnically Jewish Bolsheviks prior to the revolution and the post-revolutionary period when ethnic Jews had a great deal of power in the Soviet Union. Several factors favour our supposing that Jewish identification occurred in a substantial percentage of ethnic Jews. 1. People were classified as Jews depending on their ethnic background, at least partly because of residual anti-Semitism. This would tend to impose a Jewish identity on these individuals and make it difficult to assume an exclusive identity as a member of a larger, more inclusive political group. 
Two, many Jewish Bolsheviks, such as those in Evskezia and the JAC, aggressively sought to establish a secular Jewish subculture. Three, very few Jews on the left envisaged a post-revolutionary society without a continuation of Judaism as a group. Indeed, the predominant ideology among Jewish leftists was that post-revolutionary society would end anti-Semitism because it would end class conflict and the peculiar Jewish occupational profile. 4. The behaviour of American communists shows that Jewish identity and the primacy of Jewish interests over communists' interests were commonplace among individuals who were ethnically Jewish communists. 5. The existence of Jewish crypsis in other times and places combined with the possibility that self-deception, identificatory flexibility and identificatory ambivalence are important components of Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy. This last possibility is particularly interesting and will be elaborated below. The best evidence that individuals have really ceased to have a Jewish identity is if they choose a political option that they perceive as clearly not in the interests of Jews as a group. In the absence of a clearly perceived conflict with Jewish interests, it remains possible that different political choices among ethnic Jews are only differences in tactics for how best to achieve Jewish interests. In the case of the Jewish members of the American Communist Party, CPUSA, reviewed below, the best evidence that ethnically Jewish members continue to have a Jewish identity is that, in general, their support for the CPUSA waxed and waned depending on whether Soviet policies were perceived as violating specific Jewish interests, such as support for Israel or opposition to Nazi Germany. Jewish identification is a complex area where surface declarations may be deceptive. Indeed, Jews may not consciously know how strongly they identify with Judaism. Silberman, 1985, for example, notes that around the time of the 1967 Arab-Israeli War, many Jews could identify with the statement of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Hetschel that... Quote, I had not known how Jewish I was, close quote, in Silberman, 1985. Emphasis in the text. Silberman comments, quote, This was the response, not of some newcomer to Judaism or casual devotee, but of the man whom many, including myself, consider the greatest Jewish spiritual leader of our time, close quote. Many others made the same surprising discovery about themselves. Arthur Herzberg, 1979, wrote, quote, The immediate reaction of American Jewry to the crisis was far more intense and widespread than anyone could have foreseen. Many Jews would never have believed that grave danger to Israel would dominate their thoughts and emotions to the exclusion of everything else. Close quote. Consider the case of Polina Zemchutsia, the wife of Vacheslav Molotov, premier of the USSR during the 1930s, and a prominent member who joined the Communist Party in 1918. Among other accomplishments, she was a member of the Polit Party Central Committee. When Golda Meir visited the Soviet Union in 1948, Zem Chutsina repeatedly uttered the phrase, Ik bin a Yiddish tocha, I am a daughter of the Jewish people, when Maya asked her how she spoke Yiddish so well. She parted from the Israeli delegation with tears in her eyes, saying, I wish all will go well for you there and then it will be good for all the Jews. Vaxberg, 1994, describes her as an iron Stalinist, but her fanaticism did not keep her from being a good Jewish daughter.
Consider also the case of Ilya Ehrenberg, the prominent Soviet journalist and anti-fascist propagandist for the Soviet Union, whose life is described in a book, whose title, Tangled Loyalties, illustrates the complexities of Jewish identity in the Soviet Union. Ehrenberg was a loyal Stalinist, supporting the Soviet line on Zionism and refusing to condemn Soviet anti-Jewish actions. Nevertheless, Ehrenberg held Zionist views, maintained Jewish associational patterns, believed in the uniqueness of the Jewish people, and was deeply concerned about anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. Ehrenberg was an organising member of the JAC, which advocated Jewish cultural revival and greater contact with Jews abroad. A writer friend described him as, quote, first of all a Jew. Ehrenberg had rejected his origins with all his being, disguised himself in the West, smoking Dutch tobacco and making his travel plans at Cook's, but he did not erase the Jew, close quote. Quote, Ehrenberg never denied his Jewish origins and, near the end of his life, often repeated the defiant conviction that he would consider himself a Jew as long as there was a single anti-Semite left on earth. Close quote. Rubenstein, 1996. In a famous article, he cited a statement that, quote, Blood exists in two forms, the blood that flows inside the veins and the blood that flows out of the veins. Why do I say, we Jews, because of blood? Close quote. Indeed, his intense loyalty to Stalin's regime and his silence about Soviet brutalities involving the murder of millions of its citizens during the 1930s may have been motivated largely by his view that the Soviet Union was a bulwark against fascism. Quote, no transgression angered him more than anti-Semitism. Close quote. A powerful residual Jewish identity in a prominent Bolshevik can also be seen in the following comment on the reaction of ethnic Jews to the emergence of Israel. Quote, it seemed that all Jews, regardless of age, profession or social status, felt responsible for the distant little state that had become a symbol of national revival. Even the Soviet Jews who had seemed irrevocably assimilated were now under the spell of the Middle Eastern miracle. Yekaterina Davidovna, Golda Gorbman, was a fanatic Bolshevik and internationalist and wife of Marshal Clement Voroshilov, and in her youth she had been excommunicated as an unbeliever. But now she struck her relatives dumb by saying, Now at least we have our motherland too. Kostarenko, 1995. The point is that the Jewish identity of even a highly assimilated Jew, and even one who has subjectively rejected a Jewish identity, may surface at times of crisis to the group or when Jewish identification conflicts with any other identity that a Jew may have, including identification as a political radical. As expected on the basis of social identity theory, Elazar, 1980, notes that in times of perceived threats to Judaism, there is a great increase in group identification among even very marginal Jews as during the Yom Kippur War. As a result, assertions regarding Jewish identification that fail to take account of perceived threats to Judaism may seriously underestimate the extent of Jewish commitment. Surface declarations of a lack of Jewish identity may be highly misleading. And as we shall see, there is a great deal of evidence for widespread self-deception about Jewish identity among Jewish radicals. Moreover, there is good evidence that both in the Tsarist period and in the post-revolutionary period, Jewish Bolsheviks perceived their activities as entirely congruent with Jewish interests. 
the revolution ended the officially anti-Semitic Tsarist movement, and although popular anti-Semitism continued in the post-revolutionary period, the government officially outlawed anti-Semitism. Jews were highly overrepresented in positions of economic and political power, as well as cultural influence, at least into the 1940s. It was also a government that aggressively attempted to destroy all vestiges of Christianity as a socially unifying force within the Soviet Union, while at the same time it established a secular Jewish subculture, so that Judaism would not lose its group continuity or its unifying mechanisms, such as the Yiddish language. It is doubtful, therefore, that Soviet Jewish Bolsheviks ever had to choose between a Jewish identity and a Bolshevik identity, at least in the post-revolutionary period and into the 1930s. Given this congruence, of which one might term identificatory self-interest, it is quite possible that individual Jewish Bolsheviks would deny or ignore their Jewish identities, perhaps aided by mechanisms of self-deception, while they nevertheless may well have retained a Jewish identity that would have surfaced only if a clear conflict between Jewish interests and communist policies occurred. Communism and Jewish Identification in Poland Schacht's 1991 work on the group of Jewish communists who came to power in Poland after World War II, termed by Schacht's The Generation, is important because it sheds light on the identificatory processes of an entire generation of communist Jews in Eastern Europe. Unlike the situation in the Soviet Union, where the predominantly Jewish faction led by Trotsky was defeated, it is possible to trace the activities and identifications of a Jewish communist elite who actually obtained political power and held it for a significant period. The great majority of this group were socialised in very traditional Jewish families, quote, whose inner life, customs and folklore, religious traditions, leisure time, contacts between generations and ways of socialising were, despite variations, essentially permeated by traditional Jewish values and norms of conduct. The core of cultural heritage was handed down to them through formal religious education and practice, through holiday celebrations, tales and songs, through the stories told by parents and grandparents, through listening to discussions among their elders. The result was a deep core of their identity, values, norms, and attitudes with which they entered the rebellious periods of their youth and adulthood. This core was to be transformed in the process of acculturation, secularization, and radicalization, sometimes even to the point of explicit denial. However, it was through this deep layer that all later perceptions were filtered. Schatz, 1991. Note the implication that self-deceptive processes were at work here. Members of the generation denied the effects of a pervasive socialization experience that coloured all of their subsequent perceptions, so that in a very real sense, they did not know how Jewish they were. Most of these individuals spoke Yiddish in their daily lives and had only a poor command of Polish even after joining the party. They socialised entirely with other Jews, whom they met in the Jewish world of work, neighbourhood, and Jewish social and political organisations. After they became communists, they dated and married among themselves, and their social gatherings were conducted in Yiddish. As is the case for all of the Jewish intellectual and political movements discussed in this volume, their mentors and principal influences were other ethnic Jews, including especially Luxembourg and Trotsky. And when they recalled personal heroes, they were mostly Jews whose exploits achieved semi-mystical proportions. Jews who joined the communist movement did not first reject their ethnic identity, and there were many who cherished Jewish culture, 
and dreamed of a society in which Jews would be equal as Jews. Indeed, it was common for individuals to combine a strong Jewish identity with Marxism, as well as various combinations of Zionism and Bundism. Moreover, the attraction of Polish Jews to communism was greatly facilitated by their knowledge that Jews had attained high-level positions of power and influence in the Soviet Union, and that the Soviet government had established a system of Jewish education and culture. In both the Soviet Union and Poland, communism was seen as opposing anti-Semitism. In marked contrast, during the 1930s, the Polish government developed policies in which Jews were excluded from public sector employment, quotas were placed on Jewish representation in universities and the professions, and government-organised boycotts of Jewish businesses and artisans were staged. Clearly, Jews perceived communism as good for Jews. It was a movement that did not threaten Jewish group continuity, and it held the promise of power and influence for Jews and the end of state-sponsored anti-Semitism. At one end of the spectrum of Jewish identification were communists who began their career in the Bund or in Zionist organisations, spoke Yiddish and worked entirely within a Jewish milieu. Jewish and communist identities were completely sincere, without ambivalence or perceived conflict between these two sources of identity. At the other end of the spectrum of Jewish identification, some Jewish communists may have intended to establish a de-ethnicised state without Jewish group continuity, although the evidence for this is less than compelling. In the pre-war period, even the most de-ethnicised Jews only outwardly assimilated by dressing like Gentiles, taking Gentile-sounding names, suggesting deception, and learning their languages. They attempted to recruit Gentiles into their movements, but did not assimilate or attempt to assimilate into Polish culture. They retained traditional Jewish, disdainful and supercilious attitudes towards what, as Marxist, they, re they viewed as a retarded Polish peasant culture. Even the most highly assimilated Jewish communists working in urban areas with non-Jews were upset by the Soviet-German non-aggression pact, but were relieved when the German-Soviet war finally broke out, a clear indication that Jewish personal identity remained quite close to the surface. The Communist Party of Poland, the KPP, also retained a sense of promoting specifically Jewish interests rather than blind allegiance to the Soviet Union. Indeed, Schatz suggests that Stalin dissolved the KPP in 1938 because of the presence of Trotskyists within the KPP and because the Soviet leadership expected the KPP to be opposed to the alliance with Nazi Germany. In Separation and its Discontents, Chapter 8, it was noted that identificatory ambivalence has been a consistent feature of Judaism since the Enlightenment. It is interesting that Polish Jewish activists showed a great deal of identificatory ambivalence stemming ultimately from the contradiction between the belief in some kind of Jewish collective existence and, at the same time, a rejection of such an ethnic communion as it was thought incompatible with class divisions and harmful to the general political struggle, striving to maintain a specific kind of Jewish culture and, at the same time, a view of this as a mere ethnic form of a communist message, instrumental in incorporating Jews into the Polish socialist community, and maintaining separate Jewish institutions while at the same time desiring to eliminate Jewish separateness as such. It will be apparent in the following that Jews, including Jewish communists at the highest levels of the government, continued as a cohesive, identifiable group. However, although they themselves appear not to have noticed the Jewish collective nature of their experience, it was observable to others. A clear example of self-deception, also evident in the case of American Jewish leftists, as noted below.
These Jewish communists were also engaged in elaborate rationalizations and self-deceptions related to the role of the communist movement in Poland, so that one cannot take the lack of evidence for overt Jewish ethnic identity as strong evidence of a lack of Jewish identity. Quote, Cognitive and emotional anomalies, unfree, mutilated and distorted thoughts and emotions, became the price for retaining their beliefs unchanged. Adjusting their experiences to their beliefs was achieved through mechanisms of interpreting, suppressing, justifying or explaining away. As much as they were able to skillfully apply their critical thinking to penetrative analyses of the socio-political system they rejected, as much were they blocked when it came to applying the same rules of critical analyses to the system they regarded as the future of all mankind. This combination of self-deceptive rationalisation, as well as considerable evidence of a Jewish identity, can be seen in the comments of Jacob Berman, one of the most prominent leaders of the post-war era. Brackets. All three communist leaders who dominated Poland between 1948 and 1956, Berman, Bolslaw Berut, and Hilary Mink, were Jews. Close brackets. Regarding the purges and murders of thousands of communists, including many Jews, in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, Berman states... Quote, I tried as best I could to explain what was happening, to clarify the background, the situations full of conflict and internal contradictions in which Stalin had probably found himself, and which forced him to act as he did. And to exaggerate the mistakes of the opposition, which assumed grotesque proportions in the subsequent charges against them, and were further blown up by Soviet propaganda. You had to have a great deal of endurance and dedication to the cause, then, in order to accept what was happening, despite all the distortions, injuries and torments. Close quote. As to his Jewish identity, Berman responded as follows when asked about his plans after the war. Quote, I didn't have any particular plans but I was aware of the fact that, as a Jew, I either shouldn't or wouldn't be able to fill any of the highest posts. Besides, I didn't mind not being in the front ranks. Not because I'm particularly humble by nature, but because it is not at all the case that you have to project yourself into a position of prominence in order to wield real power. The important thing to me was to exert my influence, leave my stamp on the complicated government formation which was being created, but without projecting myself. Naturally, this required a certain agility. Close quote. Clearly, Berman identifies himself as a Jew and is well aware that others perceive him as a Jew and that therefore he must deceptively lower his public profile. Berman also notes that he was under suspicion as a Jew during the Soviet anti Cosmopolite campaign beginning in the late 1940s. His brother, an activist in the Central Committee of Polish Jews, the organization for establishing a secular Jewish culture in communist Poland, emigrated to Israel in 1950 to avoid the consequences of the Soviet inspired anti Semitic policies in Poland. Berman comments that he did not follow his brother to Israel, even though his brother strongly urged him to do so. Quote, I was, of course, interested in what was going on in Israel, especially since I was quite familiar with the people there. Close quote. Obviously, Berman's brother viewed Berman not as a non-Jew, but rather as a Jew who should emigrate to Israel because of incipient anti-Semitism. The close ties of family and friendship between a very high official in the Polish communist government and an activist in the organisation promoting Jewish secular culture in Poland also strongly suggests that there was no perceived incompatibility with these identifications as a Jew and as a communist even among the most assimilated Polish communists of the period. While Jewish members saw the KPP as beneficial to Jewish interests, the party was perceived by Gentile Poles even before the war as 
pro-Soviet, anti-patriotic and ethnically not truly Polish. This perception of a lack of patriotism was the main source of popular hostility to the KPP. Quote, On the one hand, for much of its existence, the KPP had been at war not only with the Polish state, but with its entire body politic, including the legal opposition parties of the left. On the other hand, in the eyes of the great majority of Poles, the KPP was a foreign, subversive agency of Moscow, bent on the destruction of Poland's hard-won independence and the incorporation of Poland into the Soviet Union. Labelled a Soviet agency, or the Jew Commune, it was viewed as a dangerous and fundamentally unpolished conspiracy dedicated to undermining national sovereignty and restoring, in a new guise, Russian domination. Close quote. The KPP backed the Soviet Union in the Polish-Soviet War of 1919-1920 and in the Soviet invasion of 1939. It also accepted the 1939 border with the USSR and was relatively unconcerned with the Soviet massacre of Polish prisoners of war during World War II, whereas the Polish government in exile in London held nationalist views on these matters. The Soviet army and its Polish allies, quote, led by cold-blooded political calculation, military necessities or both, close quote, allowed the uprising of the Home Army, faithful to the non-communist Polish government in exile, to be defeated by the Germans, resulting in 200,000 dead, thus wiping out the, quote, cream of the anti- and non-communist activist elite. Close quote. Schatz, 1991. The Soviets also arrested surviving non-communist resistance leaders immediately after the war. Moreover, as was the case with the CPUSA, actual Jewish leadership and involvement in Polish communism was much greater than surface appearances. Ethnic Poles were recruited and promoted to high positions in order to lessen the perception that the KPP was a Jewish movement, Schatz, 1991. This attempt to lower the Jewish profile of the communist movement was also apparent in the ZPP. The ZPP refers to the Union of Polish Patriots, an Orwellian-named communist front organisation created by the Soviet Union to occupy Poland after the war. Apart from members of the generation whose political loyalties could be counted on and who formed the leadership core of the group, Jews were often discouraged from joining the movement out of fear that the movement would appear too Jewish. However, Jews who could physically pass as Poles were allowed to join and were encouraged to state they were ethnic Poles and change their names to Polish-sounding names. Quote, Not everyone was approached, brackets, to engage in deception, close brackets, and some were spared such proposals because nothing could be done with them. They just looked too Jewish. Close quote. Schatz, 1991. When this group came to power after the war, they advanced Soviet political, economic and cultural interests in Poland while aggressively pursuing specifically Jewish interests, including the destruction of the nationalist political opposition whose openly expressed anti-Semitism derived at least partly from the fact that Jews were perceived as favouring Soviet domination. The purge of Wladyslaw Gomolka's group shortly after the war resulted in the promotion of Jews and the complete banning of anti-Semitism. Moreover, the general opposition between the Jewish-dominated Polish communist government supported by the Soviets and the nationalist anti-Semitic underground helped forge the alliance of the great majority of the Jewish population to the communist government while the great majority of non-Jewish Poles favoured the anti-Soviet parties. The result was widespread anti-Semitism. By the summer of 1947, approximately 1,500 Jews had been killed in incidents at 155 localities. In the words of Cardinal Holmd, in 1946, commenting on an incident in which 41 Jews were killed, the pogrom was, quote, due to the Jews who today occupy leading positions in Poland's government and endeavour to introduce a governmental structure that the majority of the Poles do not wish to have. Close quote. 
The Jewish-dominated communist government actively sought to revive and perpetuate Jewish life in Poland, so that, as in the case of the Soviet Union, there was no expectation that Judaism would wither away under a communist regime. Jewish activists had an ethno-political vision in which Jewish secular culture would continue in Poland with the cooperation and approval of the government. Thus, while the government campaigned actively against the political and cultural power of the Catholic Church, collective Jewish life flourished in the post-war period. Yiddish and Hebrew language schools and publications were established, as well as a great variety of cultural and social welfare organisations for Jews. A substantial percentage of the Jewish population was employed in Jewish economic cooperatives. Moreover, the Jewish-dominated government regarded the Jewish population, many of whom had not previously been communists, as, quote, a reservoir that could be trusted and enlisted in its efforts to rebuild the country. Although not old, tested comrades, they were not rooted in the social networks of the anti-communist society. They were outsiders with regard to its historically shaped traditions, without connections to the Catholic Church, and hated by those who hated the regime. Thus, they could be depended on and used to fill the required positions. Close quote. Jewish ethnic background was particularly important in recruiting for the Internal Security Service. The generation of Jewish communists realised that their power derived entirely from the Soviet Union, and that they would have to resort to coercion in order to control a fundamentally hostile non-communist society. The core members of the security service came from the Jewish communists who had been communists before the establishment of the Polish communist government. But these were joined by other Jews sympathetic to the government and alienated from the wider society. This in turn reinforced the popular image of Jews as servants of foreign interests and enemies of ethnic Poles. Jewish members of the internal security force often appear to have been motivated by personal rage and a desire for revenge related to their Jewish identity. Quote, their families had been murdered and the anti-communist underground was, in their perception, a continuation of essentially the same anti-Semitic and anti-communist tradition. They hated those who had collaborated with the Nazis and those who opposed the new order with almost the same intensity and knew that the communists, or as both communists and Jews, they were hated at least in the same way. In their eyes... The enemy was essentially the same. The old evil deeds had to be punished, and the new ones prevented, and a merciless struggle was necessary before a better world could be built. Close quote. Schatz, 1991. As in the case of post-World War II Hungary, see below, Poland became polarised between a predominantly Jewish ruling and administrative class, supported by the rest of the Jewish population and by Soviet military power, arrayed against the great majority of the native Gentile population. The situation was exactly analogous to the many instances in traditional societies where Jews formed a middle layer between a ruling alien elite, in this case the Soviets, and the Gentile native population. However, this intermediary role made the former outsiders into an elite group in Poland, and the former champions of social justice went to great lengths to protect their own personal prerogatives, including a great deal of rationalisation and self-deception. Indeed, when a defector's accounts of the elite's lavish lifestyle, for example, Bolslaw Beirut had four villas and the use of five others, their corruption, as well as their role as Soviet agents, became known in 1954, there were shockwaves throughout the lower levels of the party. Clearly, the sense of moral superiority and the altruistic motivations of this group were entirely in their own self-deceptions. Although attempts were made to place a Polish face on what was in reality a Jewish-dominated government, such attempts were limited by the lack of trustworthy Poles able to fill positions in the Communist Party, government administration, 
the military and the internal security forces. Jews who had severed formal ties with the Jewish community, or who had changed their names to Polish-sounding names, or who could pass as Poles because of their physical appearance or lack of a Jewish accent, were favoured in promotions. Whatever the subjective personal identities of the individuals recruited into these government positions, the recruiters were clearly acting on the perceived ethnic background of the individual as a cue to dependability, and the result was that the situation resembled the many instances in traditional societies where Jews and crypto-Jews developed economic and political networks of co-religionists. Quote, Besides a group of influential politicians, too small to be called a category, there were the soldiers, the apparatchiks, and the administrators, the intellectuals, the ideologists, the policemen, the diplomats, and finally, the activists in the Jewish sector. There also existed the mass of common people, clerks, craftsmen and workers, whose common denominator with the others was a shared ideological vision, a past history, and the essentially similar mode of ethnic aspiration. Close quote. It is revealing that when Jewish economic and political domination gradually decreased in the mid to late 1950s, many of these individuals began working in the Jewish economic cooperatives, and Jews purged from the internal security service were aided by Jewish organizations, funded ultimately by American Jews. There can be little doubt of their continuing Jewish identity and the continuation of Jewish economic and cultural separatism. Indeed, after the collapse of the communist regime in Poland, quote, numerous Jews, some of them children and grandchildren of former communists, came out of the closet, close quote, openly adopting a Jewish identity and reinforcing the idea that many Jewish communists were in fact crypto-Jews. When the anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic movement in the Soviet Union filtered down to Poland following the Soviet policy change towards Israel in the late 1940s, there was another crisis of identity resulting from the belief that anti-Semitism and communism were incompatible. One response was to engage in ethnic self-abnegation by making statements denying the existence of a Jewish identity. Another advised Jews to adopt a low profile. Because of the very strong identification with the system among Jews, the general tendency was to rationalise even their own persecution during the period when Jews were gradually being purged from important positions. Quote, even when the methods grew surprisingly painful and harsh, when the goal of forcing one to admit uncommitted crimes and to frame others became clear, and when the perception of being unjustly treated by methods that contradicted communist ethos came forth, the basic ideological convictions stayed untouched. Thus, the holy madness triumphed, even in the prison cells. Close quote. In the end, an important ingredient in the anti-Jewish campaign of the 1960s was the assertion that the communist Jews of the generation opposed the Soviet Union's Mideast policy favouring the Arabs. As with Jewish groups throughout the ages, the anti-Jewish purges did not result in their abandoning their group commitment, even when it resulted in unjust persecutions. Instead, it resulted in increased commitment. Quote, unswerving ideological discipline and obedience to the point of self-deception. They regarded the party as the collective personification of the progressive forces of history and, regarding themselves as its servants, expressed a specific kind of teleological deductive dogmatism, revolutionary haughtiness and moral ambiguity. Close quote. Indeed, there is some indication that group cohesiveness increased as the fortunes of the generation declined. As their position was gradually eroded by a nascent anti-Semitic Polish nationalism, they became ever more conscious of their groupness. After their final defeat, they quickly lost any Polish identity they might have had and quickly assumed overtly Jewish identities, especially in Israel, the destination of most Polish Jews. <laughs>
they came to see their former anti-Zionism as a mistake and became now strong supporters of Israel. In conclusion, Schatz's treatment shows that the generation of Jewish communists and their ethnically Jewish supporters must be considered as an historic Jewish group. The evidence indicates that this group pursued specifically Jewish interests, including especially their interest in securing Jewish group continuity in Poland, while at the same time attempting to destroy institutions like the Catholic Church and other manifestations of Polish nationalism that promoted social cohesion among Poles. The communist government also combated anti-Semitism, and it promoted Jewish economic and political interests. While the extent of subjective Jewish identity among this group undoubtedly varied, the evidence indicates submerged and self-deceptive levels of Jewish identity even among the most assimilated of them. The entire episode illustrates the complexity of Jewish identification, and it exemplifies the importance of self-deception and rationalization as central aspects of Judaism as a group evolutionary strategy. There was massive self-deception and rationalization regarding the role of the Jewish-dominated government and its Jewish supporters in eliminating Gentile nationalist elites, of its role in opposing Polish nationalist culture and the Catholic Church while building up a secular Jewish culture, of its role as the agent of Soviet domination of Poland, and of its own economic success while administering an economy that harnessed the economy of Poland to meet Soviet interests and demanded hardship and sacrifices from the rest of the people.